All right, so we're going to get going now. Uh, last time we talked about uh, sort of Chem 50 material and some of the uh, information that might be helpful for you as you kind of go through uh, Chem 51 here. Again, sort of the take home message on that, as I mentioned last time, is really we do a lot in a number of chapters of uh, you really do have to be able to sort of come up with equations and understand what you get at the result of when you kind of mix these two things together. Uh, so again, like I said, double displacement type reactions, acid base type of reactions, we see a lot in this class. Um, so again, make sure you look, look those over. It's been a while. Also, single replacement reactions uh, do sort of pop up a lot as well. Um, in addition, everything about molarity, solutions, dilutions, that's again, a lot of stuff that we see again in this class. So Again, if you need to kind of review that stuff, make sure you kind of go over that stuff uh, that will help you. Um, like I said, the first chapter here is kinetics, which is a little bit different than sort of the main sort of hunk of the class, uh, which is equilibrium. Uh, but definitely when we get into that equilibrium stuff, all that stuff about concentrations, writing reactions and all that stuff really does come into play. Um, so let us get started then. Uh, we're going to start here with chapter 12, which is chemical kinetics and there's kind of two uh, big topics in sort of chemistry that we kind of deal with. Uh, we deal with kinetics here, uh, and also we're going to deal with thermodynamics. And later on this semester, after we get through sort of all the equilibrium uh, information, uh, we'll get into a thermodynamics type chapter. And you probably already talked about part of thermodynamics, which is all that energy stuff, like you did uh, delta H, enthalpy, uh, you know, uh, any type of specific heat, uh, energy, law of conservation of energy. Uh, we will get into the rest of thermodynamics. We'll talk about uh, entropy. Uh, we'll also talk about Gibbs free energy as well. But the idea really of thermodynamics in the sense of when you kind of look at thermodynamics sort of uh, problems uh, is really to answer sort of a, a very simple question, which is, uh, you know, is this reaction going to be sort of spontaneous? And as we'll talk about more when we uh, get there, sometimes people have a wrong understanding of sort of the word spontaneous in this context. Sometimes when people hear, oh, this reaction is spontaneous, they associate that with like you snap your fingers, it happens really, really fast. And what we'll talk about when we do get thermodynamics in a later chapter, I think it's like 16, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when we talk about a reaction being spontaneous, it really has nothing to do with necessarily how fast or slow the reaction is taking place. It has to do with the idea that under those conditions, you would expect that reaction to actually take place. Now, there's a lot of spontaneous reactions that we'll talk about in a later chapter that uh, take forever to happen. But if you wait long enough, it will happen, basically. And there's some that are spontaneous reactions that will happen really, really fast as well. So when we talk about thermodynamics, we talk about reaction being spontaneous. It really doesn't have too much to do with the idea of, you know, how fast or slow that particular reaction takes place. The area of study that does deal with sort of how fast or slow necessarily a reaction takes place are the factors that affect sort of how a reaction takes place is kinetics. And kinetics, you know, we kind of look at that uh, aspect of chemistry to understand, will this reaction occur fast? Will this reaction occur slow? Uh, and again, like I said, certain factors that affect that rate, things that you could actually do if you know certain information about reactions, like if you're doing a reaction, you want to kind of speed it up. There's certain things, depending on that type of reaction, that you could actually do to it to cause the reaction to actually occur faster. And vice versa as well, if you're trying to do a reaction, like we'll get a taste of not this experiment, the next experiment, that maybe runs really fast. And if you're really slow, you can't really collect anything because the reaction's over by the time you're trying to like get your information you could actually do things to that reaction to kind of slow it down and give yourself a little bit more time. So the area of kinetics deals with the sort of that rate of reaction. And again, it's very helpful information in sort of a practical sense, like we were in lab and we're going to do an experiment. And again, you may need to like not want to wait all day for it to happen, or you may want to kind of slow it down and you could kind of play around with the kinetics of the reaction to help you do that. So one of the uh, important things that we look at sometimes when we're looking at kinetics and reactions is we look at the reaction rate and the rate, right, is basically how much 
you do in a, usually a certain period of time, right? When we drive, like we go 65 miles per hour, that's we're going 65 miles in an hour, basically, right? So that's the distance we're going in that period of time. And we're able to maintain that speed, obviously, all the way through. So whenever we look at a rate, uh, a reaction rate, it has something to do with really concentration, which is basically what we look at in a reaction. So when we have a reaction like this, A going to B, and a reminder, right, A is our reactants, right, our starting material. B is our products, which is what is formed as a result of the reaction. So when we get a reaction rate, we look at molarity over seconds. And we talked about, I think, the other day, again, molarity is our moles per liter. We really could look at any sort of concentration unit, but obviously, as you're probably familiar with, Molarity is really the most common unit of concentration that we deal with. And so we oftentimes look at molarity over seconds. What we're really looking at in this sense is how is the concentration of, say, our reactant changing with time? How is the concentration of our product uh, changing with time? When we do a reaction like this, which is, in a sense, a one-way direction, right? It is a one-way arrow. So that means everything is dumping out on the product side. When this reaction starts, we would expect, obviously, our reactants going to products. So what that means is, as time goes on, would we expect to have more or less A in this case as the reaction goes on? We should end up having less, right? Because we need A, which is our reactants, to make our products. We also should expect, by the same token, the amount of our products or B in this example to start to increase with time, right? Because obviously we're making more products, we're gonna increase. In order to make the products, you need the reactants, so those are going to decrease. And that sort of idea of increasing our, our products and decreasing our reactants is important when we write what is sometimes referred to as the rate expression. And in this case, the rate is equal to minus delta A. And when you see something like this, a couple of things, just to make sure that delta symbol means change, right? When you see these brackets, that usually means concentration. And usually in most cases, that is molarity. Again, as we're talking about sort of the concentration unit that we typically will see here. So the rate is equal to minus the change in concentration of A over the change in time. And the important part of this is A is our reactant, as we just talked about. So we would need a negative sign here on this expression. And the reason for that is when you calculate the rate of a reaction or the average rate of the overall reaction, these numbers here should usually be positive numbers. And it's important that we have the negative for the reactant uh, so that we actually do end up with a positive number. Now you may say, why is that? So if we just look at just a simple example here, uh, let's just say at the very beginning of the reaction, we have our concentration of A and our concentration of B, right? So at the very beginning of it, we pretty much have only A, right? And we got like nothing happening there for B in this case. So at the end of the reaction, Maybe we got like uh, one molar of A there, and maybe we got like, you know, two molar of B that sort of happened there at the end of the reaction. So when we go to calculate the change in the concentration of A in my made up example, always when you do the change in something, it is typically final, right, minus initial, right? That is typically how you calculate the change of something, change of volume, take the final volume minus initial volume, right? Change of temperature, final temperature minus initial temperature. Uh, so whenever you do any type of change, it's always final minus initial. So if we look at my example here, if we were to calculate the change of A, that's gonna give me basically one minus four molar, which is minus three molar. That negative that I would get there when I would do this part, and the negative that's here will turn my rate into a positive number, which is again, what we do need here. So when you get the change in any of your reactants, really the change part for that, uh, that reactant will end up being a negative number based on it decreasing with time. And again, we need that negative there. 
Now, when we get to our B, which in this case is our product, we do expect it to increase with time. So in this case, we have the change in the concentration of B over the change in time. And one absent thing here is the negative sign. We do not need the negative here on the product. And that is because we are actually increasing our product. So if we go to my same example there and do the change in the concentration of B, the final concentration was two minus zero. That gives me two molar. That is a positive number, obviously with really a positive here, keep my rate a positive number. So when we write these rate expressions, we need to have that negative there for our reactant side only. And again, really the main part of why that is, is you really should always get a negative change in the concentration of your reactants. Again, because it's decreasing with time, which means when it's all said and done, you should have that sort of negative change as it's decreasing. Um, <clears throat> When we calculate, like I said, sort of the rate, it should be a positive number. But if we calculate, for example, how specifically A is changing with time, so if we want to know specifically how just A itself is changing with time, we actually would get a negative value for how it's changing with time. And again, that would indicate that it's decreasing with time. If you were to calculate how just B itself is changing with time, you will end up with a positive value again because it should be increasing with time. So if you're specifically calculating, for example, how a specific reactant is changing with time, um, you will end up with perhaps a negative number for that guy. But if you relate it to the overall average rate of the reaction, it will end up being a positive number. So you just got to kind of watch some of the negatives and positives as you're kind of thinking about these things along the way. Any questions for that? All right. Now, kinetics is really all about a lot of graphs. So I would say in this chapter, you will see a lot of graphs. Uh, we look at a lot of graphs when we analyze sort of kinetic uh, information. I will also say as you go through maybe some of the homework problems, uh, the best way to sort of answer it is you got to go like make a graph on like Excel and stuff like that because it's sort of kinetic space. So there will be a little bit of that along the way. So uh, you sometimes will have to make graphs. But we do see some different ways that we can follow sort of the reaction over time. Obviously, here our A circles are black, our B circles are red, and we can see at really time zero at the very beginning of the reaction here, we pretty much have all reactant circles, right? So there's no products. And we can see as time goes on, we start to see some appearance of red circles, which indicates we're making products. And we also will see some disappearance of the black circles here as the amount of reactants are decreasing with time. Until we cut sort of stop, stop our run, where we have really now a majority of products present, right, and not a lot of uh, reactants left. We can also graphically see that here. If we look at the number of molecules of both our A and B over time, pretty much at time zero, it's all reactants, no products. And again, as we slowly use up our reactants, we will now make some products until you know we have a lot less reactants at the end of the reaction, and obviously we made a lot more products. Now, one way that we can follow, for example, the change in the concentration over time is if you have some type of reaction where you get some type of solution, for example, that has a color associated with it. So for example, here, the BR2 is pretty much that color. Everybody else here is uh, pretty much colorless. So we can know that pretty much when we look at these beakers, the beaker on the far left there is probably at the very start of the reaction, right? So we have a lot of BR2 present, so we could kind of see its color. As the reaction proceeds to the right and products are being made where these guys are pretty much colorless, we start to see the color of the beaker obviously get lighter and lighter along the way until it's sort of colorless which would indicate perhaps the reaction is over as we probably made a lot of products at this point, right? We don't have too much reactants floating around. Otherwise, at the end there, we would still see some orangey type color in that beaker, which we, we do not see. Now, how can we really follow the concentration with this? We can use something like a spectrophotometer uh, where, you know, 
you take a light, you shine a wavelength, uh, the specific uh, wavelength, and it goes through your sample to a detector. And it really will measure one of two things. Most of the time we measure absorbance, which is basically how much light gets absorbed by the sample versus, you know, really, you know, what didn't reach the detector, right? So less would reach the detector. Sometimes percent transmittance is uh, also recorded. We don't really do too much of that. We usually look at absorbance, but percent transmittance is really the ratio of light that went into the sample to how much got to the, to the detector, sort of that ratio. Uh, they're related to each other. The absorbance is minus the log of the transmittance. So you can kind of get one from the other if you really wanted to. Um, and the idea here is we could use something, for example, like our friend Beer's Law, right? where A is the absorbance, C is the concentration. Concentration. And B is uh, Beer's constant. Sometimes people will use A is equal to epsilon, B, C, where this is the uh, path length and the molar absorptivity sort coefficient as well. Um, but in our class, we oftentimes will kind of roll with this more graphical version of Beer's uh, law, which is A is equal to B, C. So how is this? Uh, useful to us is useful to us because we could follow the absorbance over time, right? And if my solution is, say, in this state versus this state, which one should have the higher absorbance? The one at the beginning or the one at the end in this case? It is the one at the beginning, right? The darker the solution, right, the more light's going to be absorbed by the solution, the greater the absorbance value you would have. If you have a color solution like we have at the end, all the light's just going to sail right through. No problem. Nothing's going to get absorbed, right? So it's going to kind of go right through and no problem in that situation. So by following the absorbance values here, we would actually see probably in terms of absorbance should be decreasing with time, right? As time goes on, you will start to see a drop in the absorbance value. Now, when we do an experiment like this, it's really important to set up your experiment uh, correctly. And that is what this little graph actually represents. How do we know what wavelength we want to actually set our you know, spectrophotometer to? And we actually want to set it to what is sometimes referred to as the maximum wavelength or the absorbance at maximum wavelength. The reason for that is if we were to set our absorbent, our wavelength value to in this region, set it to here, when we would go and do our samples, we have all of this absorbance that we can basically measure, which means, you know, probably all of our samples are going to be on scale. Nothing will be off of the scale. We should be able to get absorbance values at all. Now, what happens if I set my wavelength over here? What's going to happen when I start measuring most of my samples probably? you're gonna run into a little trouble because that's about all the absorbance you got available to you. And most of your samples will probably read outside of that and you'll get some errors. So it's really important when we use something like a spectrophotometer to set it to the correct wavelength so that when we do our samples, obviously they all are on the scale, not off a scale. Would I set, for example, we'll use this one here. Should I set the wavelength of light in my spectrophotometer to red's wavelength of light, right? Red's like 700-ish nanometers or something in that ballpark, right? Should I set it to red's uh, wavelength because my solution is red? The answer is no, right? Uh, what we see in terms of color, right, is the complementary color to the light being absorbed. So although we may see the solution as red, it is not absorbing wavelengths in the red spectrum of, uh, of the visible part of the spectrum. So we'd actually set it to this complementary color uh, to red. Um, so again, maybe you're in the 480-ish range or something like that. It's kind of the complementary color to red. And that's where you would actually set it to. So part of uh, when we do this in lab, and we will do this in lab, actually, I think they'll do the second part of the experiment we're going to start today, which we'll do on Tuesday, 
one of the first things you do when you sort of set up your calibration and all that is you select the maximum wavelength. And it will give you a graph like this. And a lot of times, the fancy equipment we have these days will auto-select that for you. Or you can move it to where we see the peak. And you usually, again, want to kind of choose that peak uh, so that you can uh, get all your samples doing that. Would something like spectrophotometry be good for something that is a colorless solution? There's no color. It would not because there's no way basically to follow absorbance values because nothing's going to absorb on that. So this technique is only really good if you have a reactant, for example, that has a color, or maybe you're producing something that's a color. So this could work really well if you started with reactants that are colorless, and then they gradually make some products that have a color, right? You'll will increase your absorbance if you're following sort of the absorbance in that situation. Or in something like this, where we're actually starting with color, and then it's gone. So for example, the kinetics experiments we'll do is just that. You'll mix it together, you'll have a color, and then you know the color kind of goes away. So that's where sometimes people run into trouble, as you will see and talk about is, if you're kind of slow when you mix it, you have all your color right as you mix it. And if you take too long to put it into the machine, the reaction is pretty much done. You got a colorless sort of solution and you're just gonna have a flat line on your absorbance values like the person died, right? So that's something that you wanna keep track of. You wanna be efficient when you kind of do these things because depending on how fast or slow the reaction you're dealing with is, you can be too slow and really miss the part of the reaction that you really are looking for. So how does this relate to each other? Because absorbance is related to really the color of the solution, Typically speaking, if we have a lot of our solute in there and it has a color, we would have a much darker solution. And that means that the change in the concentration in this case of Br2 is proportional, that's what the little symbol is, to the change in absorbance. So once again here, by following the absorbance values over time, uh, you can uh, really follow how the concentration is changing. You can figure out, like we'll do in a number of experiments, for example, what beer's constant is, and you will have all these absorbance values that you collected over a period of time. So you can use something very similar, easy, like beer's law here, and take A divided by beer's constant, and you can turn all of those absorbance values into concentration values, and now you'll have how the concentration changed over time, which is essentially what we're looking for in terms of the rate. So this is a very simple way that you can follow how the concentration is changing over a period of time by simply following, obviously, the absorbance value, doing a little calculation to relate your absorbance values to concentrations, and then you'll know how the concentration is changing with time. Any questions on that there? Now, obviously here, there are a couple of rates that we do talk about. And as you can see, as we mentioned a second ago, the concentration of BR2 is decreasing with time as we see here overall in this graph. And there's really sort of two types of rates that we deal with. And most of the time in this class, we deal with the average rate and the average rate versus say the instantaneous rate. Now the average rate is like taking like your whole entire reaction or your run, however long you let the run go for, whenever you stop the reaction. You could think of it sort of, if you like, like when you drive. So if you drove from here, say to Arizona, maybe along the way, you know, maybe on average you drove 70 miles per hour, but maybe there are points along the way you were doing 65, 70, 75, 80, 80. 85-ish at certain points, maybe along the way. It is 75 once you cross the border there in Arizona, so that's not too, too bad, I guess. Um, but, you know, overall, if you average your entire trip, maybe you really did only travel maybe 65 miles per hour over the whole trip. But again, if you take a look at like a window in the reaction, maybe you're traveling faster at certain points, right? You got into some traffic, you're traveling a little bit slower at certain points, but overall it averages out to a certain rate for your whole trip. And that's sort of what the average rate of the reaction is. At certain points along the way, you know, things may be reacting a lot faster, and then maybe they're slowing down a little bit along the way. And overall you have this sort of average rate that's happening. Uh, but again, if you took like a window, uh, you might see it actually reacting a lot faster. For example, at the very beginning of the reaction, you probably have a lot of reactants present, right? So they're gonna be able to find each other really quick. So maybe you'll see at the beginning of the reaction, it's gonna to start to react a lot faster. 
as you get towards the end of the reaction, you have a lot less reactant molecules floating around. So it's going to take a little longer for them to find each other. So maybe it starts to slow down a little bit as you get towards the end of the reaction. And again, you can sort of figure out your average ra rate of it. Instantaneous rate is, again, maybe in your trip as you're driving, you know, that part where you're doing 85 miles per hour. Hopefully no cops behind you for that certain period of time. But again, if you average it out over the whole period, it, um, you'll have a more average rate. So the average rate is really the change in the concentration over the change in time. Again, final minus initial. Once again, it's our reactant, so we have our negative. You can find the instantaneous rate, as you can see here, over a specific period of time by taking the slope of the tangent line uh, to each of these. And that's, you know, where you kind of pick a point, draw a, a straight line, a couple, a couple points on that line, figure out the slope of it. We probably won't do too much of taking the slope of the tangent line, but uh, that's essentially where you can kind of look at a specific period of time, a uh, specific point in your sort of reaction. And again, kind of draw, as you can see here, is sort of can see like a kind of a straightish line at that point which I was not straight anymore after I scribbled on it. Uh, but it's kind of a straight line. Again, like I say, kind of take a slope of that particular line. And that'll give you basically, in this case, the rate of how BR2 is changing over that particular period of time. All right. Now, there is a relationship when we look at sort of kinetics uh, experiments that actually does give you this sort of constant value for the reaction. And we can look at something like this, which is sometimes uh, referred to as a rate law. And we'll talk about rate laws a little bit later on here. It's a little bit different than the rate expression. But if we take this rate law, uh, that is the rate, uh, which is our molarity per second. This is what is known as the rate constant. And the rate constant actually is, to exaggerate, lowercase k. Not to be confused with pretty much what the rest of the class is brought to you by capital K, which is the equilibrium constant. So it is not capital K, it is lowercase k uh, when we talk about the rate constant. And this is obviously our concentration of our reactant. If we rearrange this and solve for K, uh, K would equal in this particular case, the rate divided by BR2. And when you do that, you can see that you pretty much will get a constant value at any particular time in this run of this experiment, uh, which is again why it's referred to as a rate constant. And the rate constant in this case, when we look at the units, the rate is typically molarity over seconds. Obviously, the concentration is molarity. So when they cancel, we get what are referred to as reciprocal seconds as the units associated with it. So a couple of things is really important in kinetics, which is there are different sort of types of reactions or what are referred to as orders of reactions. For example, the three most common orders of reactions are first order reactions, second order reactions, and zero order reactions, which we'll talk about in this chapter. Now, each of those types of reactions, first, zero, or second order, they all have more specific equations that you're supposed to use if it's first order, second order, or zero order. So the, one of the important things about the rate constant is in a lot of problems, as we'll talk about, they oftentimes will not tell you, hey, this is a first order reaction with blinking lights, you know, use all the first order equations or, you know, this is the second order reaction, use all the second order sort of equations. But what they will oftentimes give you in problems is the rate constant. And by knowing the actual units of the rate constant, you are able to actually determine what the order of the reaction is. So we'll see some different units associated with the rate constant as we go through uh, this chapter. And again, sort of the units that you see associated with the rate constant will oftentimes tell you what the overall reaction is uh, when you look at it. Now, the number here is not all that important. What is sort of the rate constant sort of represent? You could think of the rate constant as if you have a sort of really large rate constant that usually means reaction is gonna kind of occur relatively fast. Uh, if you have a smaller rate constant, it's gonna usually sort of occur a lot slower. So you can think of the rate constant as, 
you know, is it going to be sort of a faster reaction or a slower reaction? And you could just think about just looking at this very simple rate law here, right? If we just think about what I just said, if this number is a large number, right? And I multiply it by the concentration of BR2, my rate value should end up being a large value, right? Which means the reaction is going to occur fast. If I uh, just take this very simple sort of rate law and my K value is a small value, when I take a small value or a really small value for K, right, and multiply it by the concentration, this rate now will end up being a relatively small value, right? And so you can think of the rate constant, again, in that sense as it sort of describes, you know, how fast or how slow a reaction might take place. Questions on that? Now, what happens if we do have reactions where maybe we don't have color and any reactants or products? It makes it really hard, as we talked about, to use spectrophotometry to follow the change in the color over a period of time. So how can we maybe do some kinetics? Well, this is an example for here where this is all colorless on basically both sides. So everybody here is colorless, which means, again, that spectrophotometry is not going to be very useful for us. But one thing that is produced in this case is a gas, right? And if we have gases, we can use our good friend there, right? PV equals NRT. That's a little ideal gas law action, right? When we use, by the way, PV equals NRT, it has specific units, right? Each of these things, pressure needs to be in what unit? ATM, yeah. Volume needs to be in liters. Moles should be in. I'll go with moles. Temperature should always be in. All right. And our R here, right, is our 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole in this case. So in this particular case, although uh, everything is colorless, and mind you, I think they put a little dye in there just to kind of see the yellow. It kind of made it yellow so you can see. Uh, the gas that's in there. What's going to happen is we could actually follow the pressure here pretty pretty easily by setting up an apparatus like this. And the benefit of this is we could take something like the ideal gas law here and rearrange it and solve for N over V. And if I solve for N over V, that is equal to P over RT, right? Now, in this case, the temperature is probably going to be the same because you're in the same room probably as you're doing this experiment. So the temperature is probably not going to change all that much. R is our gas constant, which means essentially for the reaction that we're doing, those two are going to kind of be constant sort of values. That means really the only thing that we have to kind of follow in here is how the pressure is changing over time. This is beneficial because if we go back to that this equals N over V, you told me N is moles, right? And V is liters. Moles per liter is the molarity, right? And we can very simply here follow the change in pressure in this reaction. And we could actually figure out how the molarity here of our gas is changing with time uh, by doing that. And that allows us to do a very simple sort of kinetics experiment where ultimately all we have to keep track of, like I said, is how that pressure uh, is changing over time. We could use our ideal gas law and really relate that to how the concentration of O2 is changing over time. The only way I would have pressure in this case is for what to be made. What has to be made for me to have pressure in this case? Yeah, and there's only one gas in this case, right? And that one gas is the oxygen gas and that's on the product side. That's how I know this reaction is taking place, right? When I start to see pressure start to change, the only way I could get pressure to have a gas, and the only place a gas molecule is, is on the product side, which means as soon as I start to see the pressure start to increase, I know that I am starting to make products, right? At the beginning, I should have very little pressure, right? Because there's really no products. But as we start making the products where we have O2 present, which again is the only gas present, we will start to see a rise in the pressure. And that's how we can feel confident that this reaction is actually taking place in this case. And because it is only oxygen present, we know that the only pressure associated with it has to be from the oxygen. So that's how we can relate it to, it has to be the oxygen that's changing. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right. 
All right. So when we talk about reaction rates and we talk about rate expressions, we do have to talk about everybody's favorite thing, which is stoichiometry, right? And when we do stoichiometry and we have reactions, things do not always react perfectly equal to each other, but they react through what is usually referred to as a mole to mole relationship, right? Which is based off of the coefficients that are in the equation. So we could say in this equation for every one mole of B, we started out with two moles of A, right? So that is the stoichiometric relationship in this equation. So not surprisingly, because we are looking at an equation and we're looking how things are reacting, we do have to take the stoichiometry into account when we're doing the kinetics for that particular equation. So there really is sort of two approaches you could take when you're doing rate expressions in terms of the stoichiometry. The first sort of approach that you could do is, frankly, in a lot of cases, you could just do a regular stoichiometry problem, do like a mole-to-mole -mole relationship for whatever information you're given to whatever you're trying to find. And then at that point, you could just turn that mole-to-mole -mole relationship uh, into the kinetics part of it. Or maybe an easier way is you could actually just incorporate the stoichiometry and the kinetic stuff together and kind of do it together. So that is what we see here. This is the rate expression where we sort of incorporate the stoichiometry with the kinetics part of the calculation. So once again, when we look at A, which is our reactant, we have the rate is equal to minus because it is a reactant. We actually take one over the coefficient. So we're going to take one over the coefficient that's in the equation. And when you do that, that is really what is taking into account the stoichiometry. So that's kind of bundling your stoichiometry now with your kinetics part of it, which is the change in the concentration of A over the change in time. Once again, when we do A in this case, the final concentration should be less than the initial. So that again will give you that negative and negative that gets you a positive value again here for our rate. When we get to the product side, once again, we do not need the negative, but the coefficient here is one. So basically we take one over one, which is one. And most of the time in chemistry, we don't write ones down. So that's why there's nothing there, but it basically is one over one here. And we have our change in concentration of B over the change in time. So in general, if you have an equation like this, you could write some rate expressions where the rate is equal to, again, here, looking at A, which is a reactant, minus one over the coefficient times the change in concentration of A over change of time. Uh, that equals the minus one over B's coefficient, uh, change of concentration of B over change of time. Now we get to our product side over here where it should be positive, one over the coefficient of C, change the concentration of C over time, and then obviously the same for RD. Once again, this should be a positive number. They are all related to each other. So what is the benefit of this? The benefit of this is if you frankly just know one thing in that particular reaction, maybe you know how B is changing with time, or maybe you just know the average rate over this overall reaction. You could use these relationships to figure out how everybody in the reaction is changing with time. I could figure out how A is changing with time. I could figure out how B is changing with time, C or D in this case, by doing this. They're all equal to each other. You could set them all equal to each other like this in a generic sense, but let's just say we had information about A, but we want to know what's going on with D. We could just pull out those two things. So we could go, the rate is equal to minus one over A, change the concentration of A over the change in time. For D, it would be the rate is equal to one over D, change in the concentration of D over the change in time. How this, would this help us? If we know this, which is basically how A is changing with time, that would allow us to calculate the average rate for this particular reaction. And that average rate for that reaction is the same. Average rate for this reaction which then would allow us to figure out how D is changing. So they are tied to each other through the average rate of the reaction, which means if you know about one in there, you can then relate it to somebody else in there and you can figure out how, again, everybody else is changing. Once again, this is what I was talking about earlier. If you have a problem where maybe, let's just say you know the rate of the reaction and you wanna figure out how the A is changing with time, 
when you do that calculation for a the change of a over the change of time, you will get a negative number because again, it's a reactance decreasing with time. Now, if you knew the rate here and you want to figure out how D is changing with time, when you calculate for what's in the box over here on the right, you will end up with a positive number because it's a product. So what I was saying earlier is always when you calculate this guy, however you want to calculate them, should be a positive number. When you calculate just this part of it, how A is specifically changing with time, or how B is specifically changing with time, you will end up with negative numbers, how they're changing to indicate that they're decreasing with time. And if you calculate specifically how C is changing with time or D is changing with time, which are products, you will get positive numbers for those guys because again, they're increasing. So it is possible when you do a rate expression, you're specifically looking at a reactant. Like I said earlier, uh, you will end up with most likely a negative value for that. Uh, any questions on that there? All right, so let's take a look at one. Why don't you write the rate expression for this reaction and see what you come up with here. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so once again here, we're going to go, uh, our rate is equal to, we're going to start with our first reactant. So since it is a reactant, we do need the negative. Here the coefficient is one, which means we really don't need to put it because it's going to be one over one, which obviously equals one. This would be the change in the concentration of CH4 over the change in time. That would equal our next reactant, which also will then need a negative. This does have a coefficient of two. So to take into account the stoichiometry, one over the coefficient will do that for us. Again, the change in the concentration of O2 over the change in time. We now move to our product side, which does not need the negative in front of it because it's increasing with time. Again, the coefficient here is one, which means that also we don't really need to put it in there. So the change in the concentration of CO2 over the change in time. And lastly here for our water, we have a coefficient of two. So one over two, uh, again, change in concentration of water over the change in time. And again, here we do not need a negative for the water as it's increasing with time. Any questions on that? Again, obviously we set these all equal to each other as I just showed you a second ago, you could break off whatever ones you need. Uh, but again, if you know pretty much just one piece of information along the way there, uh, you can pretty much figure out how everybody in that reaction will be changing with time. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> I was try one with an actual numbers here. For this reaction, uh, the concentration of I minus changes from one molar to 0.868 molar in the first 10 seconds. Calculate the average rate and what is or how is the change in the concentration of H plus changing with time. So what is the, how is the H plus changing over time? Take a few moments there, work it out, see what you come up with here. Okay, so let's take a look, see how you're doing. So a couple of things, we pull out the information. Uh, we're obviously given uh, an initial concentration here, right? Of I minus uh, one molar. We do have a sort of final concentration here of I minus uh, 0.868. We, uh, if you want time or initial time, probably zero seconds and our final time kind of 10 seconds in this case. We are looking for H plus in this case. So really uh, we are given information about this guy and we are looking for really this guy when it's all said and done. So at this point, what we probably would want to do is pull out just a rate expression for those two things. No need to complicate it by doing everybody. So I know for I minus, that is a reactant, which means the rate is equal to minus because it's a reactant. Again, I do need to take into account the stoichiometry. So I'm going to go one over the coefficient there, which is a three. The change in the concentration of I minus over the change in time. I could also do a similar thing here for my H plus. That would give me a rate expression. Again, it's also going to be negative because it is a reactant. Coefficient here is a two. So it's going to be one over the coefficient. Change in the concentration of H plus over the change in time. Any questions on that so far? We have all the information we need really to come into here from what was given to us. So that's what we're going to do. So that would give us that the rate is equal to minus one over three. Again, we do want to always go final minus initial. 
So that's going to give us a 0.868 minus a one molar divided by really 10 seconds, but you want to go final minus initial in terms of seconds. That's important because when I do this part, once again, I'm going to get a negative number here. So if I did kind of larger minus smaller, I will not get a negative number. It's going to mess you up here in terms of signs. Uh, that will get you a negative there. That's going to give us our positive rate. So we're going to take uh, 0 0.868 minus 1 divided by 10 and also divide by 3, which again takes into account the stoichiometry of it. We will end up with 0 0.0044. The units here are on top molarity, on bottom seconds, nothing canceled. Molarity per seconds, which is a rate, right? How the concentration is changing per time. So what that number represents is on average, this reaction is happening, basically having a change of 0 0.0044 molarity every second is changing, right? First off, any questions on that? By the way, that is one of the answers, right? The other answer that we want is how the H plus is changing with time. So if we go to our H plus sort of rate expression, we're really interested in this part of it, how that guy is changing with time. What we just found was this guy right there. That is the same rate, basically. So that means that the rate equals minus one over two, change in the concentration of H plus over the change in time. That means I need to multiply to the other side the two because I am looking to solve for this. But not just the two, I also need to take the negative to the other side as well, right? So that's going to give me negative two times 0 0.0044 molar seconds will equal the change in the concentration of H plus over the change in time. And that's going to get me here a negative 0 0.0088 molar seconds in this case, yeah. It is a negative value here because H plus is a reactant, right? So it should be changing negatively over time as it's decreasing. So again, this is an example of if you solve for specifically how a reactant is changing with time, you will end up with a negative number. But when we do solve for the overall reaction, uh, we do end up with a positive number in terms of the rate. Question on those calculations there. By the way, this means that what is happening with H plus, is it changing on the same rate as the overall reaction is changing? Everybody is not. It's actually changing twice as fast, right? So it's changing, it's dropping 0 0.0088 molar every second versus overall, when you take everybody into account, everybody into account is dropping or basically changing, either adding or dropping, depending on which side of the arrow you're on. Uh, 0 0.0044. That's also because a little bit of stoichiometry, right? It's got like a coefficient of two. So again, that is why we have to take those things into account. Any questions on that? Now, clearly here, we could go through everybody else. If we wanted to figure out how everybody else is changing with time, uh, we could also do that as well. Any questions on that particular one? Uh, why don't you try this one then? Uh, if uh, you got 2.4 times 10 to the 2 grams of NOBR, molar mass from the periodic table, 109.91 grams per mole. Uh, if it decomposes in a 2 times 10 to the 2 milliliter flask in five minutes, what is the average rate of BR2 production? Some information about our NOBR. And we eventually want to get ourselves over there to uh, the BR2. So once again here, I'm just going to kind of pull out the rate sort of expressions for those two guys. Uh, we will have our rate is equal to, it will be negative one over the coefficient, which is two here. Uh, change the concentration of NOBR over the change in time. For our BR2, that's going to be the rate is equal to, again, it'll be positive. Coefficient here is one, which means we don't really need to put it. Change the concentration of BR2 over the change of time. So obviously the concentration is molarity and here we got it in sort of parts. So we got to do a little bit of some work here. So uh, we'll start with uh, the moles of NOBR. Uh, so we got uh, 2.4 times 10 to the two grams 
they were nice enough to give us the molar mass, but obviously if they did not, you would need to go to the periodic table and go calculate that yourself, right? Grams on the bottom, moles on top. That way the grams cancel. And that's going to get us here uh, 2.4 to 2 divided by 109.91. I'll call it 2.1836 moles of NOBR. Uh, we have a volume here, uh, basically 200 milliliters, which is roughly 0.2 liters. So to get the molarity, right, of our NOBR, we will take our number we just got there, 2.1836, 1836, and divide it by 0.2 liters. And that's going to give us a molarity here of what's decomposing of... Well, I'll call it 10.9. I'll call one. We'll go a little longer. They're one eighth molar. That is essentially the top number, right? That's the concentration there of NOBR. Since ultimately we do want our time in seconds, and our time right now is in minutes, might as well do a little conversion, get it to seconds so everybody's in the right units. At some point, you got to do it. So uh, five minutes, uh, hopefully that's like still a minute, 60 seconds. That's like 300 seconds, right? That is the uh, basically bottom part, right? So that's the change in the time in this case. So now we have everything. We could actually put it in there. The rate uh, will equal minus one over two, negative 10.918 molar divided by basically 300 seconds. I made it negative Y. It is a reactant, which means technically if you did final minus initial to get that number, uh, you should end up with a negative number because it's a reactant. And that also is going to then make our rate positive, which is what we need, right? So we kind of, in this case, has to sort of throw the negative in there to help us out uh, again. And that's probably achieved by taking final minus initial where you would get a negative number. All right, with that being said, uh, we'll do that there. That's going to be, uh, lost my number. There it is. Uh, times uh, nothing, no timing. We're just dividing. Dividing by two and dividing that 10.918 by 300. That is going to give us 0 0.0182 units again, molar seconds. That is the average rate here. Now we can relate that to really how BR2 is changing with time. So we want to know the rate is equal to the change in the concentration of BR2 over the change in time. And frankly, that equals that. And that would be the same number, basically, right? It's a one-to-one -one relationship there. Yeah. So our BR2 production in this reaction is basically the same as the overall average rate that's happening in this particular case. First off, any questions on that there? Yeah. Say it one more time, is it? Yeah, so the idea here is it's gonna completely decompose. So that's basically how we get the negative there is kind of zero. At the end, there'll be nothing left, basically. So kind of zero minus what we have there, yeah. Yeah, other questions? <clears throat> Yeah, so the question was, again, uh, basically at the end, you, it fully decomposes, so you have zero, basically minus your sort of initial concentration there of, of that there, which is essentially where the negative comes from. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> now, this is the way, obviously, that we did here where we incorporated basically the stoichiometry into the kinetics part of it. As I mentioned before, if you want to take more of a, just a, sort of stoichiometry approach first and then kind of do the kinetics part of it, uh, you can. So if you're going to take more just the stoichiometry part of it, which is, you know, you basically just want to get over to BR2, uh, you could just start with, after you convert your moles of NOBR, you could just do a basic stoichiometry problem at that point, moles of NOBR. Again, using the mole to mole relationship between those two, and you would do for every, again, two moles of NOBR, you got one mole of BR2. And at that point, you would have 
2.1836 divided by 2 gets you 1.0918 moles of BR2. You now can convert those moles of BR2 into molarity uh, by dividing it by the 0.2 liters. That's going to give you 5.459 molar BR2. Now, we've now taken into, if we think about it here, our concentration, right? We just got our concentration. Now we could do the kinetics part of it and divide it by our total time, which is 300 seconds. And if you do that and not do 3,000 seconds like I did on my calculator, you'll get the same answer there, 182 molar seconds in this case. So you can take really a uh, stoichiometry approach if you want to do it. The reason it works, you know, the other way, and it kind of does it all together is, frankly, we did one over two. That's one over two. That's the stoichiometry part of it, right? So it just sort of incorporates it into there. And obviously, uh, you know, that's how come it works, basically. So you can do either approach, whichever way you like. But again, sort of doing one over the coefficient kind of bundles it all together and just takes care of it in one step. Any questions on sort of rate expressions or how to do that there? <laughs> All right, so we'll talk a little bit about some of the factors that affect uh, the rate of a reaction. So uh, one thing that can affect the rate of a reaction is uh, the nature of, say, your reactants, uh, what physical states they are. Uh, if you have small molecules, they typically will react faster than larger molecules. Um, gas molecules tend to react faster than liquids and liquids faster than solids. So you think about gas molecules, they are flying around, right? So they got a lot of energy. When they hit each other, they have a lot of energy. When a reaction starts, you need a certain amount of energy to kind of get up and over the hill to the other side to make products. So those guys are good to go, right? They're able to kind of cut in contact with each other. Liquids still have a good amount of energy, right? They're floating around, right? They're moving around the ions and stuff in there, and they're able to react. Solids, frankly, are just sitting, right? Not doing very much unless you help it out, right? So obviously they're going to be the slowest of things sort of reacting. But even with solids, there is a degree of how they react. Uh, if you have a powdered sort of solid versus a block solid, it just allows a lot more surface area for things to start reacting with. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you still do that. Do you guys still do the experiment where you like uh, coiled like a piece of magnesium ribbon, put it in some HCL and collected the gas, right? And they tell you not to like coil it too tight, right? And if you ever did coil it too tight, perhaps when you did that, uh, you sat there all day waiting for your bubbles to happen because the HCL couldn't get to the metal because you kind of prevented it from doing that. Now, if you just slowly coil, they would lie a lot of surface area you saw it probably started in the bubble really quickly because the HCL could reach all the magnesium relatively easy. Or if you were working with somebody that couldn't tie a knot really well, your magnesium just passed the HCL as they were coming up the tube and you didn't get any bubbles and stuff like that. So um, certain types of chemicals are more reactive than others. The activity series of metals, we typically see that with like single replacement reactions. You might remember an activity series usually is just a list of elements uh, where we have... Uh, a lot of times hydrogen sort of in the middle-ish and then a bunch of elements listed above and below hydrogen. And anybody higher on the list, for example, in an activity series are more reactive than anybody lower on the list. Anybody lower on the list is less reactive than anybody higher on the list and they won't replace each other. And that's like this type of reaction that we talked about uh, the other day. Uh, this guy comes in to kick this guy out, making something like this. In order for this to happen, this guy has to be more reactive than what it's replacing. Obviously, if it's less reactive, you would not get the reaction to occur. Ions definitely react uh, faster to molecules because where we find ions is where do we typically find ions? They are in solution. That is pretty much where you find ions. They're floating around. They're floating around freely, which means they're good to go if they come in contact with something they want to react with, right, and maybe make a solid, for example. We're talking about solubility. Uh, they help break bonds. They're just kind of floating around, which means good to go. Temperature is a really big effect on sort of the rate of a reaction in general, but not for all reactions. But in general, if you sort of increase the temperature by like 10 degrees Celsius, you typically will double the rate of the reaction will occur a lot faster. 
Obviously, the opposite is true. If you throw everybody on ice, the reaction will occur a lot slower, right? The result of that is in order for a reaction really to take place, as we'll talk a little bit more about in this chapter, you need a couple of things to happen. You need, uh, you know, things to collide with each other. So they actually have to hit each other. They actually have to hit each other in the correct spot. But more importantly, they need to hit each other with the right amount of energy uh, to get up and over to the product side. And obviously, if you increase the temperature, what you're doing is providing a greater proportion of molecules that have enough energy to get to the other side. And that's going to result in a lot more reactions and collisions that do take place, resulting in products being formed. By the way, not all collisions, two things hit each other, uh, will actually lead to products being formed. Again, they need to hit each other in the right location and have the right amount of energy. Opposite is true. If you sort of put everything on ice, you decrease the temperature, you're going to get everybody moving around a lot slower. So it's going to take longer for them to come in contact with each other. And also, when they do come in contact with each other, they might not have the right amount of energy to actually form products. So those are things that will slow down the reaction. We'll actually see an equation, which is the Uranus equation, later in the chapter, which uh, basically deals with the relationship between the rate constant and different temperatures along the way. Another really important factor in terms of affecting the rate of a reaction is a catalyst. A catalyst is uh, not a reactant. It's uh, not a product. And again, it does not get used up in the reaction. I would say in most cases, uh, the catalyst is there to allow the reaction to proceed faster than it normally would without it. Uh, there are negative catalysts, uh, which actually can slow down a reaction. So again, in some cases, you might want to slow a reaction down. But I would say probably 99.9 .9 times if somebody talks to you about a catalyst in your daily conversations, how you're having those conversations, I'm not sure. But uh, they're probably talking about it in terms of it speeding up the reaction uh, rather than maybe slowing it down. We typically, when we see catalysts, they're typically written on top of the arrow. So it could be like a metal. Uh, it could be H+, which is an acid catalyst. Uh, and again, the way a catalyst essentially works, as we'll talk a little bit about as we go through the rest of this chapter, the way a catalyst essentially works is that it finds an alternative pathway for that reaction to take place. So you can think of it as finding like a more efficient pathway for that reaction to take place. Um, you know, for example, it could be something as simple as it being a solid catalyst where maybe you have gas molecules flying around that are kind of attracted towards the solid. What that does is it then puts those gas molecules a lot closer to one another, and that's going to sort of promote them reacting a lot more efficiently than if the catalyst wasn't there and they're just kind of flying around trying to find each other. So it kind of makes like almost like a central location in that example where everybody could come together. It can also aid in breaking some bonds as well, uh, but it allows them to come together in a more efficient way of finding each other. That usually, again, would result in a, a much faster reaction taking place. Catalysts can be homogeneous, like homogeneous mixtures, which means homogeneous is the same throughout. That means the catalyst and whatever is reacting, the reactants, are in the same phase. Uh, for example, if you are doing a couple of solutions together and you use an acid as a catalyst, acid is also a solution. They're all in the same phase. Heterogeneous is things in different phases. So like my example there with the solid and the gas molecules, they're in different phases. And uh, obviously, they will react that way as well. Generally as well, concentration plays a really big effect in how fast or, again, how slow a reaction may take place. Uh, generally, the larger the concentration, uh, the faster the reaction. It increases really the frequency at which molecules can come in contact with each other. So if we think about molarity, which is a very common unit of concentration, that is moles of solute per liter of solution, right? Is really the formal definition there of that. By the way, when you have a solution, right, there's two parts. There is the solute, right, and the solvent. When you have a solution and another solution and you pour them together, 
what in those solutions are actually reacting? Is it the solute or the solvent? It is actually the solute that's reacting. Yeah, so it is actually the solute molecules, the stuff dissolved in there that's reacting. The water, for example, isn't doing much other than providing a medium for those solute guys to float around in and dissolve in, basically. It's doing a little bit more than not much, but uh, it's really the solute molecules, right? Because if you had, for example, sodium chloride in the left beaker or flask, that means what you really have floating around are sodium ions, right? And chloride ions, right? And you have some water that's surrounding all those guys, right? If you had, say, silver nitrate over here, right? You basically have silver ions, right, floating around and nitrate ions floating around, right? Those are the solute in each of those things. When you throw that into the big thing together, you then have sodium ions floating around with chloride ions, silver ions, and nitrate ions. And these are all the solute molecules basically floating around together, right? And it's at that point that these two guys find each other, right, and go, solubility rules, I'm going to make a white solid, which is silver chloride, right, and start to precipitate out of solution. So it's always the solute molecules that are reacting. So that is why when we have a larger concentration like molarity, that means we're going to have, in order to have a large molarity, we need a large value of solute molecules there, right? So big molarity, more solute present, right? More solute present means there's more of these guys around and they're going to be able to find each other a lot quicker. The opposite is true as well. If you start with a very low concentration of your stuff when you put it together, you might wait there all day, right? Because you don't have a very much of those guys floating around. So it's going to take longer for them to find each other and have that reaction basically take place. So definitely concentration plays a really big role. Also with gases, concentration plays a really big role as well. And on the partial pressures, right? The higher the pressure, typically you have higher the concentration of your gas, right? By the way, when I have a really high pressure with gas, what happens with the volume? Is it large or small? Yeah, Boyle's Law, right? A little uh, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, right? Pressure goes up, volume goes down, right? Pressure goes down, volume goes up, right? I think that's how that goes. It's been a while. Not too long. It's only a couple of weeks ago, actually. So uh, what that means is if you have really high pressure, you have a small volume, right? And all your gas molecules are quite close to one another, right? Which means it's not going to take a very long time for those guys to start to react, right? So you'll see sort of probably an increase in the rate of reaction. If you had a very low pressure, that probably means a couple of things. Uh, you probably have a much larger volume. And again, it's going to take a little longer for everybody to find each other, right? And it's going to take a little bit longer for those reactions to sort of take place. Any questions on... Factors that affect constant uh, reaction rates. All right. We will lay it up there for today, I think.